very square project. Um, um, it's a proposed PUD, and it will help solve two social issues relevant to the town of Randolph. First, it'll help provide affordable housing to Randolph residents, and second, it'll use solar and thermal technologies to achieve energy, the energy efficient status of net zero, which is pretty neat. And personally, I think this project would um, create a new environmentally friendly and affordable development that would likely attract a young new demographic to the town of Randolph. Um, in case you didn't know, um, Sound, the Salisbury Square project is a multi-phase project that was originally permitted in 2009, but the housing financial crisis um, in 2008-2009 stalled this project um, and under that permitting. Uh, originally, it was under the 2006 Randolph Town Ordinance that explicitly allowed for PUDs such as this. However, the new Randolph Ordinance amended in 2016 does not include PUD language, so we therefore voice our support um, for the re-inclusion of PUD language back into the ordinance. Um, so this, we, are, we suggest that this amendment will make Salisbury Square and other innovative, innovative developments possible by providing the town with a sound flexibility device that will encourage growth in the downtown and village areas of the town, which are areas where the town generally wants to grow. Um, and we are not alone in our support of PUD language needed to make Salisbury Square happen. Um, the state statute suggests that municipalities should provide for planned unit developments to permit flexibility in the application of, planned, of land development regulations, and the Randolph Town Plan supports development of energy efficient, affordable housing such as the Salisbury Square project. So just to conclude, um, we ask the select board to vote in favor of the zoning amendment to re-include PUD, PUD language in the ordinance and thus help Randolph and Vermont achieve the goal of compact, pedestrian, friendly development of where the town and the state wants it. So we have a few handouts as well, in case you want to look through some of the the, um, the, the statutes and the regulations, the town plan, and some of the comments that we provided on this project. Um, so John will <coughs> hand some of those out. We're also happy to answer some questions if anyone has some questions. Do they each have a presentation, or is one presentation for the group? Okay. Any questions for the students? Are there any big differences between the PUD as it's written here and as it was written formally? So my understanding is that these PUDs are a bit more narrow than as originally planned in 2006. So this PUD language will only include three zoning districts, districts, and those are um, R the RVHD district, the business district, and um, the East Village district. So those are mostly all centri um, located centrally in this, uh, the town. It's um, actually a little more limited. Yeah, it's, yeah, a little more limited than the previous one. The previous one applied to the um, whole town of Randolph. This is just, a, just three um, districts. I just had one clarification on that, if I may, Jenny Carter, is that it's the exact same language that was in the previous, the 2006, except for I think there was a definition added that was missing. Um, and by saying it's more limiting, it's just limited in terms of its application, in terms of what districts. Um, because it was really intended to be a, a the way it was drafted is really concentrating on trying to promote the high density development in downtown and village districts. Any other questions, comments from anyone? Great. Thank you. So that will close the hearing. We actually take up adoption later in the select board agenda. So we'll get to that part. But now we're going to change our hats to be liquor control people. <laughs> so we'll call to order the Board of Liquor Control. First item on the agenda is anything for the Liquor Control Board. Any public comments or anything not on our agenda? No, we don't have samples. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, do you approval of the agenda? If I may ask the board to make two changes. We had two applications arrive um, after the, the posting period, both for larger um, uh, alcohol sales locations in town, one for Sodexo at DTC and the other for Kenny Drugs. Um, we included the applications in your packet, matter of convenience, if the board wanted to 
to hear those applications today. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of Sodexo and Kenny Drugs. I'll second. Um, before we do that, just a question. Did we get a new application in from m and because they didn't answer if they were criminals? just has to be there before it goes up uh, to the state. Okay. I think we do this with them every year, and we have to go back and tell them they got to mark the box of whether they are or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not saying they are for the public record, just saying they missed the boxes. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda with the added items. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Carries. <coughs> Approval of the minutes from January 23rd. Move that we approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Now we have uh, the licenses to approve. Can do them all at once? Sure. So is m and included or not included? It's included. Okay. You just got to finish the check boxes. Yeah. All right, so I would make a motion to approve uh, liquor licenses for Rite Aid, Middle Branch, Market and Deli, Bob's M&M, Kinney Drugs, and Sodexo. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Carries? Any other business for the liquor board? No. Seeing none, motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And carries. And now we are the select board again. So we'll call the regular select board meeting to order. And first item on this one is public comment. This is something for the select board this time that's not on the agenda. Yep. Just identify yourself for the record, please. Um, this is Tamara Morgan. Um, I'm the treasurer for Kimball Board, um, Kimball Library Board. Um, just wanted to update the select board on um, the fact that we had a special meeting to talk about how to spend the McNair funds that we got. Um, we've been doing a lot of strategic planning around um, our own and the town's strategic plan. And uh, we decided that we would fund up to $25,000 for youth engagement, up to $25,000 for events, and up to $50,000 for building needs in this next fiscal year, um, closing 2021, if that's right. And then reserving the other 100,000 for the following year. Um, we're going to set up a way for people to propose what the events might be and to go through the board and to make sure that the money's being spent um, uh, responsibly um, and just to see we felt that that was about the right way to divvy it up um, given that those three things are our, um, kind of the highlights of our strategic plan. Any questions? What was the second 25,000? Um, events, like programming. And events. The, the first was youth engagement specifically. Thanks. We have approval of the agenda. I may ask the board to consider a change for this meeting. Um, the change is, uh, or the change that is being asked to be considered is adding working communities grant to the grant section. Uh, the town was recently awarded a grant and I would like to ask the board to accept the grant. Okay. Can I, can I ask a question, Adolfo? Is this, is this the part where I might introduce myself? Uh, the public comment? No, we're just okay. doing the... Okay. We're doing the agenda now. Public comment's over. Did you have something that's not on the agenda? Yeah, he, he does. He, he wanted to speak to the board during public comment. Okay. For a second. That's so do I. Uh, let's get through the agenda now that we're on it, and then we'll come back Absolutely. to you guys. Yep. Okay. Is that the only change at all, though? That is the only change. Okay. We've seen a motion for the agenda. 
move that we approve the agenda with Adolfo's um, addition. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Now we'll come back to the public comment for you. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I missed the opportunity when she sat down. I'm Dr. Charles Foster. Uh, I have a chiropractic practice here in town, uh, Randolph Chiropractic Associates. Uh, it's a subsidiary of uh, some other offices that I have in different communities. And uh, we've been here, uh, I think I've been uh, principal owner since 2013. And uh, I've been very interested for a number of years in the Singer Building that uh, the town presently owns. And the fact is at one time I had a contract on it and it didn't work out at the time and you guys ended up with it and I noticed that it's still empty and I've been watching it whenever I come to work and I see that it's still empty so I would just like to let the board know that uh, I am interested I don't know what your, what your plans are for it at this time but uh, I would be happy to start negotiating with the town uh, about the possibility of moving this unperforming liability off of your thing into my performing asset column <laughs> So we are, are we still in the six months on the child care study? No, six months ended last month mm -hmm. in January. Uh, I have reached out to the, the child care group to inform them of uh, things that have happened since then and that the six months have expired. Uh, they are working with a municipal planning grant that they received through the town. Um, they feel that this grant is going to allow them to explore other options. They are, um, they haven't, come out right and said that they favor other locations, but they do believe that a location off Route 66 would be favorable for a child care facility. Um, and they they understand that the town is in a position where it would like to unload the, the building. So if there's an actual purchase, uh, purchaser that's out there, they, they're okay with the town moving on, but they will have a firm answer, a more firm answer by I gave them a deadline of March, and they agreed that by March they should have a more firm answer. Okay. So as soon as we hear from them, not to pull the carpet out from under them, even though their six 100%, months is up. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. We can. Have so I'll just stay in touch with you. the town manager. Sounds good. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Crystal Courier. I own Five Greenhouse Avenue, and. Um, I just want to talk about the access road and just my concern since I've owned the property two years now. Um, it was tore up in the fall, but apparently not by the town. And actually, nobody really admitted who tore the road up even more um, and made it further onto my property. But yesterday, the town said that a backhoe had gone up there and trees were torn down, boulders were moved. The land is, is dug up on the access road pretty far into my property. Now, I understand, I have the deed, I understand the right of way. I guess what I don't understand is why it's becoming a two, two lane road now. And I thought maybe it was because of the Winterfest, but long after the Winterfest is gone, the trees aren't, are gone. <laughs> and the land has been tore up where the root cellar is, exposing pipe. So now I've had to put a no trespassing sign because it's dangerous. And I guess I'm just trying to find out at what point is it, is it going to stop? At what point, you know, who's going to stop tearing that road apart? I can't really get an answer on that. All I hear is, well, the right away. And legally we can do this. But just because you legally can do something doesn't make it right and doesn't mean you should. So I'm trying to find out at what point when is it going to stop and should I put a fence up and how far do I have to put the fence up to stop the road from being tore up? Uh, the issue was reported to the water department. The water department spoke to me about the issue. There is a right of way that allows the town water department to use so that it can access the north reservoir and the three wells that are being uh, proposed for the area. Uh, and that is a right of way that Ms. Courier is referring to. So uh, that, that, that basically that long driveway that goes up to the, to the wells. That's right. Okay. And we have a right of way to go up to the wells. The issue that may also come into play is that there's another property that has a second right of way off of that right of way that spurs onto their home. And so as we plow only our section, the water department plows a section so that the truck can make it up, up the road, 
Um, it could be that the neighboring properties that have these second rights of way also plow and make the area much more wide. Um, the only plow that we use is the pickup truck, and that's because that's the only uh, truck that has to make it up to the water uh, facility up there. Uh, we have extended um, an offer to the property owner so that if she feels that the property that, that her property has been damaged, that she could submit the, the information we need to file a claim with with Passive. I don't um, want to claim, and I don't. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to stop further destruction. Is all. I'm, I don't want to put a fence up because then the turkeys can't get to the property, and neither can the deer. Yeah. If I put a fence up, so I'm trying to find out. Nobody is really saying who's doing it, and it, no one's really answering well, that I can't, question. I, I can't share with you that. I mean, I could also share with you an aerial view of the area that clearly shows a right of way well, to the it. reservoir. I have it here. I'm trying to you know, right. I, I, I might want to get rules. that other party. Yeah, it's There's the other property owners. that's not here so, tonight and see if what what they're doing and what our folks are doing and then look at what we should be doing. So I was told it was the Ellis property, which is nowhere on my deed. So. Right, but, but before we get to the Ellis, the, the Ellis lot that is owned by the town is is where the reservoir is, right. way further beyond your property. Right. But as we're standing on the right of way, and if we look to the right, we see your property, and we look to the left, there's there's another property that shares that right of way. And then as you move up another 50 feet, there's a third property on the left that has a second right of way off of the, the main right of way. And that's what the chair is referring to, that if you work with me, I can more clearly show you the right of way that, that you're referring to along your property. And then also the other two rights of way that provide access to your neighbors on the other side uh, to... I own the other side. Okay. See, there's a little, there's a portion on the other side. And okay. for whatever reason, that side doesn't seem to be moving over. So it's wasted land. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure this out. Because <laughs> I plan to stay in Randolph. We just moved here. Yeah, please feel free to call me tomorrow. We, okay. we, I could, we could sit down and we can look at photographs and we can look at the aerial views and determine where the boundaries are and okay. we can talk about the trucks that are that need to access the road. Uh, we don't have to have dump trucks that go up there, so it just needs to be wide enough for uh, you know, an F-350 pickup truck. It is, to, to wide, make it up there. it is wide enough for two of them now. Right. If you went and saw the damage, you'd be surprised. Right. But so you might have to pull that. another party in, too. Exactly. That's not so can I ask a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. So this, my understanding was, because I own the property, the, you know, the first property. So was this started back last fall? Is that when this first occurred? Because I was... Somebody called me up and said, did you just mow all this? And I didn't mow anything, anything yes. to do with that. I mowed, I mowed I the started. property, the Ellis property for the Conservation Commission. I mow that field above you, okay, and then I mow my field. But somebody mowed something, and I thought I understood it to be it was the power company had contracted somebody to mow the right-of-way for the power line. Is that right. correct? That's correct. And in mowing it, they exposed the root cellar completely and piping and... and and cause damage, but okay. I figured the trees there, big boulders are there. Yeah. There's no way that the, it's going to move further. And then with the backhoe moving those two things, yeah, I don't destroying know how the that train. came to be, but I do know that the power company or the power company or somebody had contracted somebody to do that. So you might want to look into that, Adolfo. Yeah. Okay. Because I think the power company has a right of way up through there also. For the for the power that goes to the reservoir. Yeah, there are a number of different there are entities. There's the town. There are the two neighbors. The two neighboring properties. There's the three-phase power or the, you yeah, the power three mount yeah. power that's up there. So, um, if you were to call me, we could okay. connect with all the parties involved that use the right of way, and at the I very just least, want the destruction to stop. Yeah, sure. That's why I moved here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more public comment? <laughs> Consent calendar. Meeting minutes from the 23rd and warrants. <coughs> One second. In favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? New business. You are up. Yep. Supervisor Union. So it sounds like you're invited to talk a little bit on taxes, where things stand. Um, there's a 
rather large um, presentation in the packet. It might be easiest if folks give me an indication of where you want to start or what you're interested in. I can kind of tailor things a little bit. There's also packets of folks who are in the audience that may be interested. This is about the school budget. Um, so feel, feel free and, and welcome. So this generated off from, we're putting our budget together. We're trying to keep the town affordable yep. for folks. And we were looking at uh, what the town needs are, what's there, uh, and how do you keep that in a reasonable amount of growth so you don't price the town out when we're trying to bring in businesses and uh, you know have young folks that want to buy homes and start up here and do that whole you know, shift in dynamic. And then we heard that there was another good size increase coming out of the school and we were like, this yeah. isn't helping us. And you know, we have two budgets that are pretty sizable that come together to create what your property tax rate is. And we don't control both of them. But somewhere in the whole realm of things, that becomes what a big piece of the affordability question when we put us together. But we sort of do our budgets in a vacuum yeah. And then magically they come together and we sit here and say, oh, we did, we did really well. We only have a small increase. And then they get their tax bill and they're like. <laughs> so we can talk a little bit, um, might, might make a little bit of sense to, to go into a little bit more detail so folks understand um, the whys and the rationales there. Um, in terms of a longer term plan for the school district, um, the school district in and of itself has the potential to actually be a great benefit to the town. And the way that that works is if we improve that district to the point where the outcomes um, that we're achieving for the students are so high, um, you will get people that are moving into the town to take advantage of the schools. Um, we started that process about two years ago and it is actually starting to pay off in terms of school districts. Uh, the name of the game for funding is enrollment. As enrollments go up, so too um, does the money that we receive from the state. The more money we receive from the state through the education fund, which is funded by all the taxpayers in the state, the less of a burden it ends up being on the town. So what we're doing at this point in time is we're investing in the schools because they hadn't been invested in for a long time. Our enrollments are climbing. We're one of the few uh, districts in the state where that is happening. And at some point in time, if things continue the way that they are, those enrollments are going to overshoot the investments that we're putting in. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that in the budget. The other piece in terms of the, the landscape um, of our budget this year, there's a huge piece that is out of control, and that has to do with the statewide health care negotiations that went on. Um, last year, the legislature um, started to negotiate with the teachers union, um, put a law in place where the negotiations are statewide. So the state group actually negotiates directly with the teachers union, and that applies to every district in and across the state. They went into it with the intent that it was going to save money, that was the goal. Um, what ended up happening, however, was quite different for most districts. Um, the agreement that they reached allowed a whole other category of employees within the school districts um, to receive uh, full health benefits that hadn't received it before. In our case, that one change uh, made by the state that we had no control over, um, no voice in, um, impacted our district for $740,000 uh, in terms of that decision. That's huge. That's bigger than what I usually ask for, even in the big budgets. Um, and so we are in the position where the majority of the increase that folks are seeing and experiencing this year, and for next, um, that 740000 will be split out over two years, the way the agreement ended up um, working out, um, will be high. Uh, there was a big article in the Digger a few months back that Statewide, on average, um, you can expect uh, the increase in schools to be 6%, which is right around where we are. Uh, I can go into detail in terms of the numbers. I can talk about what the actual impact in Randolph is going to be. Um, folks, remember that the district uh, impacts three towns. We impact Randolph, Braintree, and Brookfield. 
There's a page that says Randolph in it. This one may be missing. Randolph bottom line. Uh, third page from the back. So what potentially we're looking at, and I tried to break this out in a way that kind of made sense to folks. Um, what you're looking at is a 5.11 cent increase per $100 of assessed home value. Um, average home value in Vermont is $253,000. Um, so the average tax increase for the year would be $129, uh, which is $1075 a month in Randolph. This estimate, we don't have perfect numbers from the state. We don't get that until uh, after uh, voting day on the 3rd um, because they need to know what the, ch the towns are actually charging the state um, so that they know what they've got to fill the education fund with. Um, the big piece that I think it's important for folks to realize uh, is that there is an income sensitivity threshold. Um, you have to fill out an extra form on your taxes, uh, but it provides a significant discount. So if your family income is less than $90,000, your household income is less than $90,000, and the value of your property slash home is less than $400,000, um, you qualify for that subsidy. Um, so it's important to make sure that folks apply for it. Um, flip over a couple other pages and then just jump in with any questions yeah, you've got. Yeah. On. Yeah. So this average tax increase that you're mentioning here, that's the total dollar amount that someone would see as an increase on the school portion of their property taxes from last year to this year? Yes, yeah, so that 129. Yeah. Do you know what that is as a, <clears throat> what that 5.11 cent increase is as a, as a percentage increase from last year? So the overall school budget increase from last year to this year is 6.47. Okay. Yep, that's in here as well. Uh, let's put a couple of pages. Again, because I didn't know how much time you wanted me to spend, so. Flip to the second page, uh, the one that says total new expenses. Um, so this is talking strictly about what we are adding um, relative to the dollar amount from last year's budget. You can split it up basically into two categories. There's the discretionary spending. Those are things that we have control over. Um, those are things that we're asking for to improve education for students. Um, in one case, part of it is for a teacher at, at Braintree because the enrollments have grown so much they need an extra teacher. Um, some of it is for a partial math teacher uh, in Brookfield um, to try to help out with their math program, um, to split it out so that they're doing um, math classes by grade instead of having multi-grade math classes because it's better for the students. Um, about 100,000 of the discretionary of that 405 um, is to put in a professional development plan across the district. One of the reasons that the scores have been so abysmally low for the last 16 years is because we are one of the few districts in the state um, that has ne neither a curriculum director um, to make sure that our teachers are teaching what they should and as well as they should, or professional development money to train them in the programs that are going to most um, have the most impact on kids in a, in a positive way. Um, so I'm not asking for a curriculum director in there. Um, I am asking for a professional development budget of about $100,000 that right off the bat next year um, is geared straight towards the high school at this point in time because the elementary schools are doing really, really well. Uh, it's going to facilitate a uh, revamping of the curriculum in science, a revamping of the curriculum in mathematics, a revamping of the curriculum in ELA. Um, it's also going to bring in some training in what they call a responsive classroom. We've got a lot of students with trauma, uh, which is a community-based problem, um, that come into the schools whose behaviors interfere with learning. And so we need to give our teachers some training um, to be able to interact with those students in a way um, that, that, that allow them to heal. Um, and that's a, a lot of what that's about. We are also building an elementary um, science curriculum. There is no real elementary science across the three elementary schools. Um, so that's scheduled to go in there. So on the discretionary side, the stuff that I actually have a lot of control over, um, you're looking at about $415,130 total. But over the last couple of years, because of the investing and the work that we've been doing, especially at the elementary level, 
our enrollments are increasing, so we are actually generating revenue at this point in time. That revenue is growing year after year. Um, right now, the offsetting revenue that we have generated is close to 300000 for next year. Um, so most of the discretionary, right, um, three quarters of it is covered by, you know, what we're generating in revenue because of this investment. That number will continue to grow uh, because of the improvements we've made. Um, the enrollment across the district is up anywhere from 50 to 70 kids. I have 30 some odd students alone that are coming to the high school that are paying full tuition at $17,000 a pop to take advantage um, of our high school from other districts. We have people that are moving into town, which is going to help the tax base here, right, because the tax burden is spread over more people. Um, to take advantage of the elementary schools at this point in time. And a lot of that has to do with the preschools that we put in over the last two years. So again, the, the effort, or at least the vision, the long-term vision here is to keep that growth going. As that enrollment increases, um, we generate more revenue as a school. Um, you get more people across the three towns, which is more people to spread the tax burden over. If we do things right, um, eventually, a few years down the road, there'll be a break-even point and then a reversal point. Um, and we are on, on track to do that. So if we flip over a little bit, we've got the non-discretionary side. These are the things that I don't have much control over. The first piece you'll see there is health care, right? Um, it's 340000 this year and it's 340000 next year. That's the, 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 about the 740 to 780 that we're talking about. Um, there's a little bit of an increase to facilities. Um, things were, be straight up and blunt, things were mismanaged for facilities for years. Um, and we're still taking account of repairing and replacing things that need to be repaired and replaced because they weren't taken care of the way that they should have. Um, special education, um, we're actually doing very well. Um, we've got about a 9% increase to special education um, for next year. Uh, we are revamping how those uh, services are delivered um, to hopefully recoup even more savings um, as those changes have a, a stronger effect on the students with the goal of we've got all these students that are on IPs. If we provide better service to those students, um, we should be able to make more of them independent so they can come off the IEPs and our special education population shrinks. Um, for years, they did not have um, enough folks to actually provide the services to make the students independent. They had enough services to manage them, but not to actually get them off the IEPs. Um, the last piece there, the big chunk, the 685000 and we are stuck in a negotiation year again um, because of the statewide health care bargaining. Because no one knew what the outcome of statewide health care was going to be and what the cost was going to be. Um, it would not have been prudent to engage into a contract with the teachers union or the other unions um, without knowing those costs. Um, it, we just couldn't, couldn't have done it in good faith. Um, so that amount represents their potential increase um, for next year, depending upon how negotiations go. Could be more, could be less, uh, but that, that's the estimate based upon comparables across the state. Those things on that side are out of my control. So you're looking at a 6.4 or 7% increase. If I wipe out what's in my control, you're at about 6%. Um, so Couple of questions on that page. Sure. The help, 340,000 you said times two, but is that an ongoing cost? So yes and no. So because there's a whole new layer of personnel that have access uh, to, to health care than before, there's a huge upfront cost. That's the, the 740 to 780,000. We're splitting it out over two years because the way the state came back and said is okay, based on the negotiations, those health care plans don't change until um, halfway through the school year next year. So we get half the impact next year we get the remainder of the impact in the year that follows. Now, why? I, so at that point in time, those increases stop, but there's a problem, um, and it has to do with compounding. Remember, for at least for the schools, healthcare goes up just the cost from the insurance companies by 14% per year is on the average. They've just added another 780,000 to my budget 
um, that I have to supply money for, that when healthcare goes up, it's regular 14%. I'm paying 14% on that 740 to 780,000 as well. Um, and that's a significant chunk of change year after year. Um, so even though those larger pieces just to allow those folks access to health care, um, those big increases stop after next year, um, I've got that compounding piece. I'm paying 14% on top of that every year just because of the way the health care rises each year, um, the cost of the health care plans. So it's not an increase, it's, but it's going to be there every year. Yeah, not an yeah. It's, not, yeah it's not going away. <coughs> and special ed, are we into block grants yet? So... They've pushed it off for a year um, at this point in time. They had a big, what they call a waiting study um, that the legislature had uh, UVM do. Um, and so basically what the waiting study is doing is it's, it's adding information that they can put into the formula um, to calculate how much money should go to each district. And what they are talking about with waiting is that, okay, should districts that have a high poverty rate we have a high poverty rate, we're around 40%. Because you have a high poverty rate, should you get a little bit more in this financial formula than a district that doesn't? Um, if you have a high rate of um, students uh, with emotional disturbances, because those tend to cost more, should you have an extra consideration in this financial formula? So they just got that study. It's 155 pages long. Um, they've already pushed things off a year. It is possible um, that what will happen is that they will need time to digest that information, um, so they may push it off for another year or so. And we have to gain or lose with one part. You can't tell. There, there's not enough information out there yet. Um, I am concerned uh, because the way things work right now, um, if we tend to have a lot of students move in mid-year. The um, way things work right now, if I have a real expensive student move in, um, and some of the students are 200 to 300,000 a piece um, to be able to service. Right now I know when they move in, because we're under the reimbursement um, method, that I'm gonna get a significant amount of money back from the state to help me out with those students. What happens in the case of a block grant? I get the money up front. It's based on the formula, which is really based on the total student population you have in the school, not so much your percentage of special education students versus regular, but the total school population. So I get the money up front. And of course, the reason they did all this was to save money, so it's not going to be as much as you know, we've had before. And I get two kids that move in, and each one's $300,000, and I'm not getting any more money or getting reimbursed for it. What happens? Um, that's a catastrophe. <clears throat> happen. So what I've been doing to plan for it um, is at the end of each budget cycle the last <clears throat> couple of years, if there is any money left over, um, and we typically do have some money left over, I have built a reserve fund for special education so that if one of those catastrophic events occurs, I've got something I can pull from um, to, to kind of help out a little bit um, so that it doesn't have a dramatic impact on the schools. Um, so it sounds yeah. like we're a year or two off on the block. Yeah, we're at least, we're at least two, two years off. There's a tran transition year. They pushed it off a year, then there's a transition year, and then we're there. Um, but again, you know, the legislature, as they examine this waiting study, um, because for the, in terms of the overall, it means that if they accept the findings of the, the, the waiting study, the overall cost, the overall amount of money that they're going to have to put into this block grant system is going to be much higher than they predicted it could be. So it's unlikely, but it is possible they may change their minds on it, um, given what the cost may be across the, across the state as a whole. So good question. So as we've shifted the investment in the education, what are you seeing in the scores? So we hear a lot from employers that they lost a potential employee because of the yeah. school scores. So the, the main focus, the primary focus for the last two years, the first two years I was here, um, was elementary. Um, what is happening at the elementary level because of that work right now is that the most public scores we have are SBAC. Um, <coughs> Our SBAC scores have increased 5% per year. We're up 10%. We're actually in a pretty good category if you compare us across the state at the, the elementary level. 
and that's awesome. It means that um, our kids are, are, are very well prepared. It means that when they get to the high school that they actually have the foundation they need to engage in that level of work. The focus of this year's budget, especially that 100000 uh, that I was talking about for the professional development, that is geared directly for the middle school and the high school level. Um, they've been struggling um, for years. It is not the fault of the school. It is not the fault of the teachers. As a district, the district has never provided the resources needed um, to do that work. Um, so the hope is, is over the course of the next two years, you're going to see the same sort of dramatic increase at the high school. Um, I worked in some very wealthy districts in Massachusetts. Um, when the scores are high, people move into town to take advantage of the schools. Um, and it's beneficial for everybody. Um, that's the goal. That's what we're focused on. So we got everything going right at the elementary schools right now. We built the preschools. The preschools are a huge draw, um, especially the fact that they've all got after school programs. Um, people will move into town just to take advantage of that, which is one of the reasons the populations are growing at, this, at this, the, the elementaries, um, because that's a rarity in the state. Um, there are not many districts that offer that. So again, the, the goal is always that focus on enrollment. Um, and how, how we do that, we've got to improve the outcomes for kids. If we go back to the way that things were, um, the way that things were, it worked something like this. Budgets were incredibly low. Um, the budget increases didn't keep up with the cost increases that were occurring every year. So every year there were cuts that were happening. When you make cuts, especially to programs or staff, your schools become less desirable. Fewer people want to attend, you have to make more cuts, and you're in this downward spiral that you can't get out of. It was hard, but we've reversed that spiral. Um, that's why the enrollments you know, are increasing there. And I don't want to go back to that. Um, if I can get the enrollments up, there's going to be a break-even point in, in about two years. Um, and hopefully it will exceed, you know, we'll actually be able to either keep things neutral or even reduce is the goal and the hope. Um, there's another piece that was important. The outlook for the next two years. So we're in a position where at the last minute, literally we got notified um, in December, um, the final outcome of the statewide health care negotiations just before budget season. You know, we got, we got notified of this impact. If we look ahead for three years, barring any more legislation coming out that may have a dramatic uh, impact on the schools in terms of costs, um, things are pretty good. The, uh, I got what I need after this year. Next year, we've got the 340000 increase we've got to deal with, with health care. The big question to the community is, do you want me to take the last step in terms of the preschools? Um, the year after that, we've got what we need. Um, and the only increases that we should be making, barring any mandated changes from the state um, is as the enrollment grows up, we'll have to add staff to, to you know, um, attend to the students because of the enrollments have gone up. Um, the preschool question is this. Um, what we did, we started out with kind of a three-step process. We're on step two. Um, we have full day preschools uh, at two of the elementaries, um, partial day in the morning and partial day in the afternoon at, at Randolph. Um, the final step in the process, which is the cost of which would be about $300,000, is to have full day free preschool at each of the elementaries um, in the district for four-year-olds. Adding another year of education for every student in the district uh, that, that is coming in at that, that, that early grade. Um, it's beneficial in a lot of ways because when you combine it with our after-school programs, parents have the ability to drop their four-year-olds off in the morning, go off to work, and pick them up at the end of their work day. Um, it's beneficial for the school because I'm getting a whole extra year of education um, to these students at the time when they're the most malleable, right, where it's going to have the greatest impact on them um, in terms of socialization skills and in, in terms of setting them up for success. Um, as they get into later grades. Um, but again, that's a question for the community next year. Um, we can stay where we are right now. 
Um, one of the reasons that I, I didn't push for it this year, aside from the state health care piece, um, there's actually two reasons for it. Uh, one is that the way that it exists right now, it is generating revenue. You know, that, that wasn't the intent of it, but especially the after school programs are generating revenue, which are offsetting some of our costs. The second piece is because um, the state as a whole recognizes that there's a shortage uh, of space in terms of childcare right? as part of the R3 group. Um, what they haven't done yet, and what we've talked to the legislature about, is that, okay, you want us as a, a public school to help you out with the childcare issue, we're willing to do that because it is beneficial to us. The problem is, is that for every student in kindergarten through 12th grade, you give me $10,300 from the education fund. It doesn't come from this town, it comes from the education fund to support my budget. They don't do that for the preschool kids. They give me 3300 So if I'm gonna do a full day preschool, then you should be paying me the same 10300 um, into our into our budget um, to help those plans that you have. And so my hope is, is that a year or two down the road, they're gonna make that decision. Um, there is an uh, important chart in there um, probably the last one, unless people want a little bit more, because I know this stuff can be a little bit dry. But if you flip over the page from where we were, from total new expenses to the OSSD expense summary, um, you see those lines on the right-hand side. How funding for uh, the public schools works, uh, it's, a, it's a little quirky, so I'm gonna, it'll be a very simplified version. But you see these levels, this $10,883 per student. Every student that I have in that building, the state from the education fund gives us $10,883 for it. That money doesn't come from the three towns. That money comes from everybody in the state paying into the education fund. From that threshold, from the 10,833 to the 18,756, um, you know, dollars that we're paying from students, 33% um, of the money per student in that range is coming from everybody across the street. The other two thirds come directly from the three towns that feed the school. Um, and so, you know, we're, we'll be at 17,994 per student next year, which is is pretty much the average for this area. Um, the red line there, that's the scary threshold. If that's crossed, any additional dollars above and beyond that come directly from the towns. Um, so I'm doing um, everything possible, um, and we will always be below that red line. Um, but we are maximizing, for the most part, what we are able to draw from the state as a whole um, through the budget process, if that makes a little bit of sense. So does that imply that as long as we stay below that red line that we almost like we're incentivized to increase to that point because we're getting subsidy from the rest of the state to do that. Yeah, we're not we're not we're not getting a lot of subsidy for that from that ten to the eight, but thirty three percent is a pretty good chunk of change. Yeah. So that thirty three percent um, is coming from taxpayers across the state. Every taxpayer is paying on stuff. Because you too. Right. right. right You're right. paying into that also. Yeah. Right. But nowhere near at the rate that you are if it's coming straight from, from Randolph or well, two two thirds of the rate. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's, and, it's uh, yeah. and if others and if other districts are doing it, then it's sort of like <laughs> you're at a disadvantage. So you almost have to do it. Mm -hmm. Well well part of it part of it um, you know with us in terms of the cost piece is you know you can also think about mm -hmm. it as is economy of scale. <clears throat> We do draw income. We, if the schools are better and people are moving in, we have money that's coming in that's not coming from us. Those 33 kids that are coming in, actually I think it's 37, um, that are paying tuition to come to the high school, they're paying $17,994 to, to attend our schools. That's a big chunk of change that we're not paying for. So that's the idea behind the growth. If, if we can get things growing and keep the, it growing, there's gonna be a break even point. Yeah. Makes sense. Tax base will will level off, um, and the towns are going to benefit too because you're going to have a broader tax base. You get enough people moving into town, then hopefully you know you're going to have businesses that are going to want to come in and serve them, um, right? So you got to move in and build something, not just move in, because the tax base yeah. doesn't grow unless you're building new houses. Yeah, or, new, are, or new, new properties. Well, or, or improving some. 
But who's who's going to be paying more in taxes though? If you've got my my, my argument will be that if I've got a, a working family that's moving in, they're going to pay more taxes than a retiree um, or a, an individual. Uh, but for the town, the taxes no, come the grand from list is what for you. That. Okay, so yeah. we get it so I'm on the school building. side, so you yeah. get it by the person in your school. So yeah. for you, it's good if the young families move in with kids and all that. For so us, for you, it's, it's on based the on the household. That's why you said we yeah. want them to come in and build something. Yeah, right to add to that. The the people that we are seeing moving in, um, there's a there's a word for it, and I always forget forget the word. Um, but because so much of folks' work is online now, um, they come in, they work from home on the computer, and then you know once or twice a month they drive back down to Boston or whatnot. But that those are the folks that are moving in at the elementary level right now. Remote workers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's that's the demographic that we're seeing. Um, so we got to work on the house, the housing piece. It sounds that's like. The, well, we're working on the housing piece. I mean, yeah. there's there's conversations going on about the housing piece. But the point being is, is that you know. The town doesn't see any increase unless the grand list grows. Yeah. So if these folks are coming here and they're just buying existing homes or, or, you know, if they're improving existing homes, yes, at some point that comes back online, but nothing's going to change here unless there's actually new construction happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, the, the, the intent, um, you know, budget-wise, um, is we don't want to ever get ourselves in a position where we're going through that downward cycle again. Mm -hmm. um, an average budget, once everything is settled out and the health care piece, piece passes and, and the town makes, the three towns make the decision on the, uh, on the, the, the preschool piece, average increase should be in the 25 to 3% range if you want to keep things <coughs> you know, steady. If you're not increasing by that much, then what it, what it means is that your increases are smaller than your yearly cost increases and you're going to be back at the cutting. But that, that would be the norm. You know, that's the goal to get settled into. If we get the enrollments, at least on the school side, it, it can be significantly lower than that. But the 2% you're talking about is your budget. Right, not necessarily the tax rate increase. No, not not a two percent on your two two percent increase on, on your to your tax rate. I couldn't even. It's it's probably less uh, a penny or less. Just wanted to be clear for those that are yeah, going to be that. watching this video at yeah. a later date. It's it, it's funny. I get a little frustrated because the um, the tax formulas, especially for the school, are so complicated that I can sit down. I can spend three or four hours, and, and at the end of that, it's like okay, I kind of get it. And then if I walk away for for more than an hour or two, it's gone, and I gotta gotta relearn it all mm -hmm. over again. Um, it's crazy. It's that complex. But it is. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Well, Question. Thank you. Uh, questions or I'm anytime folks have questions or or, or want to just ask, I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Thank helpful. you. Very helpful. Thank you. We have representatives here from the uh, Randolph Post of the American Legion that uh, could add more information to uh, the ongoing work with uh, Cliff Park Finance Director and also a trustee of public funds member. Uh, but the, the issue itself is that the American Legion Post in 1968 initially gave uh, a plot of land known as Grant Park to the town. The process itself didn't really see itself through, uh, through the whole process, so the town took possession of the deed, but the deed was actually never signed over to the town, so that it officially says the town is the owner. So um, we have possession of a plot of land, town records indicate that we're owner of the land, but the actual deed itself doesn't reflect the fact that we own it, so we're hoping to correct the issue, and we have Peter and we have uh, Lori here to talk a little bit more about their work. Uh, well, <laughs> thanks. The American Legion and, and Cliff have had several discussions, very productive discussions, and I think the genesis of those discussions was first, what restrictions are there on the grant funds that were turned over to the town, and grant being the grant family, not grant being the, the largesse we all get from heaven. Uh, the grant funds, uh, well, let me back up. And I'll just give you the historical background as, as Cliff and Lori and I have figured it out. In 1938, the Grant family, in honor of the World War I veterans, proposed to give the one acre of land 
on South Pleasant Street to the American Legion for the purpose of in developing and improving a memorial park for the World War I veterans. And uh, to endow that, they gave five shares of American Telegraph and Telephone Company stock with the restriction that the income from that corpus would be used to maintain and improve the park and the principal would not be <coughs> invaded. Uh, and those, those documents are, well, so in 1968 there was a meeting of the American Legion where uh, the, that meeting, the, the members voted to turn the American Legion, uh, the American Telegraph and Telephone Company stock over to the town and to file the deed to the land in the town offices and to dissolve the, uh, the corporation that was owning the park. And then let's, uh, that was in 68, so that's 55 years later that uh, we started talking about the funds and there was some discussion about improving the park and some mention in the uh, town reports it was 97, 94, 97 thousand dollars in the thing and people just started thinking of wonderful ways to spend it. Uh, and that started some discussions and, and uh, between Cliff and Lori and I, in those discussions, we've, we've resolved that that's not all income that can be uh, spent as, as a principal. And it wasn't clear over the time what exactly what is principal and what is interest. And of course, the stock was five shares in 38. It was 70 or 80 shares in 1968. And now the stock has been transferred and reinvested. And it's not even American Telegraph and Telephone Company. So it's some difficulty in retracing what is principal and what is interest, but we've got a fairly good idea of, of that that we can agree to. Uh, and over the years, the Legion has been engaging people to maintain and improve the park and coming to the town with invoices. And we wanted to have a discussion about really who is authorized to do that and the obvious, the obvious answer, as you all know, is the, the American Legion members can't spend funds that are being held by the trustee of public funds under an obligation. So uh, we have been discussing uh, really ways in which the Legion might be able to recommend improvements, but that the, the authority to make the maintenance improvement be the town's authority to do so, and the town will contract for that stuff, even the mowing. Well, we've been doing the mowing and sending the bill to the town. Uh, and that also led to the fact that... And what's the problem? Yeah, what's the problem? With that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> some guy's making it a problem, so... <laughs> Cliff didn't like the way the books weren't balancing and... <laughs> so, in, in going through all of that, we discovered that the, quote, filed the deed in the town meant they took the original deed from Grant to the American Legion, and the original agreement with the grants of the American Legion with regard to the endowment, and they put it in one of the drawers in the vault. And there was never a deed created which conveyed the property by the Legion to the town. And so that, of course... <laughs> well, yeah, we want our money back. We want our money back. We want our money well, back. <laughs> well, there has been discussion of that in the Legion, and, and the, okay. the, the yeah. essence of it is, yeah. no, we think there's more headaches than there are benefits okay. of having the money back. Sure. So, okay. so uh, and in a, in a way, I have to apologize to Cliff a little bit. I don't know how much the board has heard, and we've had a very good, productive relationship with Cliff as we worked through this over the last few months. And I don't want to come down and, and start putting words in his mouth because he wasn't here tonight. But we're doing it. Right. Uh, but, and at this point, there's only a recommendation by Lori and I uh, to, the, to the Legion membership, yeah. membership that uh, we convey the property to the town and that we enter into a memorandum of understanding with the town, which sets forth all of this stuff. So there's a record somewhere that can be found and an acknowledgement that the trustee of public funds have the control, but an acknowledgement we hope on behalf of the town that 
uh, you would accept recommendations from the Legion with regard to what improvements might be recommended. And, uh, and this is something I put in after Cliff left, it occurred to me, and we would like an understanding that on Memorial Day, the priority of use for that park might go to the Legion so they can continue the Memorial Day exercises without being told, now you stand on the street. So that is the recommendation that we are making to the membership, but we can't gift something to the town or convey something to the town unless the town will accept He's it. He's willing to take it. So, and then, without Cliff being here, we're saying, "Come on, guys! You want to take? You want, want to own an acre of land that you've been believed to have owned for some time?" So we have a uh, in front of you in your packets is a draft memorandum of understanding. If the board uh, was willing to entertain the 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 offer being extended by the American Legion, the memorandum of understanding in your packets would be the the first step in resolving the decades-old issue. Um, from my understanding, this MOU has not yet been reviewed by the American Legion membership. That's correct. So then the, the board here could could agree to continue the conversation with, with this potential MOU, and if the board is so inclined, can authorize me to continue working with Cliff or, and the American Legion to hammer out a final product if the board is interested in taking possession of the land. And at the end of that memo, I've added five just as another talking point with Cliff, which in my draft reads, the American Legion of Randolph Post 9, or any successor thereof, shall have priority use of Grant Park on Memorial Day to conduct public memorial observations. So, and, and, so I would, you, and Cliff would say, if he were here, the 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 rule of the um, trustee of public funds were, were is always to follow the intention of the gift. So if it's cemetery gift, if it's it, in this case it was a gift to benefit the veterans to honor veterans. This the park is is supposed to stay that way in perpetuity. Um, so that that is in everything that we would be, we would certainly expect um, to continue. Any questions, anybody? That would be in the deed, right? It is in the deed. It's not very yeah. clearly in the original deed. The original deed and the original agreement set forth the, the restrictions and covenants on the property, except it, it, it can't. there was a pool created. And you'll remember this. I don't. That was part of a fountain in a pool was to be built. And the pool, I understand from Steve Webster, uh, was covered over probably in the 50s because some young child drowned in it. Diggy Blodgett. Mm, yeah, so. Yeah, we just, so, we just found Other that. than that, uh, the <clears throat> Grant Park has been improved and developed as in the deed. And obviously, those restrictions in the deed run with the land, and they would have to go to the town. Yeah. There was another sentence that I thought would be useful. Okay. On number four, it says the town of Randolph agrees to maintain Grant Park on an annual basis. I thought that would be a good clarifying statement. And then go on as is there. I'm sorry. What you just said is not in here. Is that the sentence you want to add? That's, that's just personally, I think that would. Well, I can't do that because I'm dropping everything. <laughs> Say that again. The town of Randolph agrees to maintain Grant Park on an annual basis. Why would we only maintain it annual versus ongoing? Once a That's year, fine. we just have to go in and mow the lawn once a year. The the, 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 really? ma the major part of work that has been done there in the past is uh, the trees have been pruned and taken good care of. That's and uh, several years ago, a little before my time. Trees were removed and replanted, but the, the, the maintenance of those crabapple trees, which is the, the side of the crowning glory of the park, uh, other than that, keeping the grass in decent shape, um, which is difficult because it's a sandy, sandy lot, um, and they do have a water, they did put water in there uh, several years ago, and then light, the lighting of the flags. Uh, that that fly all the time. Those are really all the maintenance that goes on there. 
the trimming of the trees, the mowing of the grass, the watering of the grass if needed. And last year uh, that started this whole kerfuffle it was the 100th anniversary of the American Legion. And because several of the members of the Legion were under the impression that they had a tremendous pot full of money sitting there for the improvement of the park, we went ahead and started to spend some money and, and put in some new uh, plantings, mostly bulbs and, and, and uh, perennials under, the tr under some of the trees. And we did have some very grand plans, but I had been told by our past treasurer that there might be something that we needed to look into about uh, spending a lot of money down there. So that's when we started. And I went and saw Cliff, and we started finding out that we didn't have anywhere near uh, the kind of money that we thought we had for improvements. And that started us on this whole road to trying to finalize the deed, the transfer of the deed. Trying to explain this to our membership is very difficult because people have had assumptions about it for years, um, but we're getting there. Um, and finding out and wanting to be part of setting up a process where uh, the Legion can still be involved in perhaps some of that maintenance, um, but having a, a real process that we go through, uh, that things are not just brought into the town and signed off on uh, in sort of a helter-skelter way, which has happened in the past. Yeah, we're not, we don't want that anymore. So my understanding of, of the Speaking in generalities about the pot of money is that the, the, the pot is available, it's just that the, the details of the use of the money is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the details say that only the interest is available for use every year, and that interest isn't, a, you know, someone will see $90,000 and will think, oh, we have that pot of money, but really it's the generated interest on a yearly basis that is available, which limits the type of work that can be done at Grant Park. That is correct, the interest. And there's not just the mowing, there's an electric bill to keep the light on the flag, there's water and sewer for the watering, and uh, a few minors like that. Yeah. Can I go back, Patrick? Can we say the town of Randolph agrees to maintain Grant Park, period, or the town of Randolph agrees to maintain Grant Park in accordance with the requirements of the deed? Sure. Yeah. There's not something like that. Maybe. That would be good. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. this will we'll, we'll continue to work with Cliff on all of this unless you've got other direction. Yeah, I think you think that's the legal bills get paid and not the legal bills, the expenses that you talked about. Well, I think incurred. some of what we're looking at right now is just is the town interested in the Legion of Adolfo and Cliff continuing to work out what these details are. So we're not, uh, we're not going to be approving this memorandum on Sunday tonight. We're, no. we're, no. we're going to be, <coughs> we're, gonna be we're, we're, gonna, we're basically saying, let's continue. In yeah. concept, we agree it ought to be. We're bringing it to your attention and saying it's yep. a process. Okay. Because the Legion will have to vote among the membership. We haven't talked about the, uh, the cost of preparing deeds and transfer documents, so. I don't know whether that would be part of the uh, trustee of public funds or whether I, I think it would really have to stretch the general construction of English language to make that a, a cost and part of the uh, of the grant funds. But you could build the original members of the American yeah, Legion sure. that didn't. And, and we still have the list of those names. We, knew, we know who those folks are. <laughs> they may not pay. I'm sure their families would be very surprised. Yeah. I'm Marty Strange. I live across the street from the park on South Pleasant Street. I'm really glad to have this conversation going on because it's it's long overdue. We need to resolve this. The park has deteriorated in the recent years, and um, the original deed called for a fence to be along the front of the park, a decorative fence. And I have assumed that the shrubbery that's there has fulfilled that obligation, and I think it does so beautifully. But that shrubbery is really getting unwieldy. There's spikes on it that are that long. And you know, when shrubbery gets really long spikes, pruning it really doesn't make it look like a shrub anymore. So I'm hoping that this moves ahead as quickly as possible and that this spring, you know, we're getting the kind of work done 
that needs to restore the park really to the beautiful place that it once was. And I'll confess, I have more at stake in this than anybody because I sit on my front porch <laughs> and I admire that park every evening. It's a beautiful place. No, it is a lovely place and it needs to be maintained. So. Yeah. yeah. Forward, right? Okay, thank you. That's one for your list. <laughs> None for ours. <laughs> Are there any expense issues now? Was the question I was trying to get at before? Is that all? Yes, there's so, an outstand there are outstanding bills from some of the work that was done this this past so year. So that needs to be paid. Yeah. Yeah. Several of them have been paid, but there are some that are that are still outstanding. Right. I am going to drop down to item twelve Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Which is the amendment that we had the public hearing on to the land breaks, because I don't think you guys want to sit through these other topics. I should have probably done that earlier. But um, any questions on it? Anybody want to make a motion? Two for it, Larry. I just took a bite. Yeah. The perfect time. I know it was. Regarding the question earlier, it was, uh, am I allowed to speak? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, no, like, uh, I, I didn't answer it fully. Um, so the three districts that this amendment is limited to, the community limited, is limited to is the Randolph Village High Density District, the Commercial Business District, and the East Randolph Village District. So those three districts are um, where this PUD amendment will be applied. Thank you. Any questions? Wow. Well, I'm still on the commission, okay? So I think it would be better if you did it this time. <laughs> but I can if you'd like. Okay. I'll move we do the three. You're perfect. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Can't wait all night for them. Okay. Unless we can eat I'll the second that. I was, I was oh, you were going to do that too? That's okay. All right. As Sorry. long as we get it done. That's a motion and a that. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Good motion deal. carries. All right. Thank you. Okay. Going back up, local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, Yes, the town had received a grant um, from, or really the state of Vermont on behalf of the town of Randolph and several other towns received a grant to complete uh, an updated local hazard mitigation plan. Um, we sent out an RFP so that we could receive assistance to complete a local hazard mitigation plan we received one um, application, and that was from our Regional Planning Commission, Two Rivers out of Quichi. Uh, they would like to help us create our plan. Um, and, and normally we would have more options, but um, we sent out the RFP uh, to local experts as well, um, and we really only had one. That's what they're supposed to Yeah. Okay, so. If the board um, uh, would be so inclined, we'd love to have a vote to accept. Uh, looking at previous minutes, I don't believe the, the select board actually accepted the grant granted by FEMA to the state and then awarded to the town. But if uh, the board were to accept the grant and then authorize me to establish a sub-grant agreement with our regional planning commission, we could commence with the project. Correct me if I'm wrong, this is the effort we used to go around and actually check with businesses on what some of our risks are, uh, or hazards? No, that is um, uh, what's called a tier two report. That right, but we, didn't we use Kevin O'Donoghue to do this the last time, any round? Maybe the last one was five years ago. It could have been this, this project. Um, we also have what's called the local emergency management plan. That one's a yearly project, but I think maybe you're referring to this one five years ago. We did send the RFP to uh, Mr. Donahue, but no response. Yeah. 
Okay. Just some of the data that we were hoping to come out of this with for the fire services yeah. study. I can't imagine that we're going to get much when the line item for it is twelve hundred dollars, yeah. and they want a hundred dollars an hour for the people. Yeah. We are hoping to offset our match from the information collected through the committee. <laughs> But uh, they aren't giving us any data. So we, uh, um, but a part of the subgrade agreement can be that uh, we either conference in someone from Two Rivers to our meetings and ask them to help us with the process as well. I'm over we accept a grant and they did. Second that. I have a question. Mm -hmm. We actually had more money than we need. Uh, we tailored um, our RFP to the total amount that we have. We have to have a match of at least 25%. Um, that could come in through cash or in kind contribution. And the majority of our uh, proposed match is going to be an in kind contribution. Um, the grant was a little over ten thousand. The total grant, but that ten thousand includes our our twenty five or twenty three hundred dollar match. So it'll be the whole grant is ten thousand and change, including our twenty five percent. But the amount that we are receiving cash only is seventy um, like seventy four hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and that is what we would have reimbursable for. Expenses. It's ample funds for what we need. Uh, we're, we'll make it. <laughs> so maybe we could, could we add in what training wants as part of it? Uh, well, it's two separate reports. Uh, they, they're going to different companies and asking what they have chemical wise, uh, danger wise. Um, we're doing that now for our facilities. Uh, the other companies have to report to our fire department and to FEMA, so not to FEMA, but to. Forget the agency they report yeah, to. Yeah, that's a tier two report. Yeah, tier two just report. chemicals they have on base in, yeah. in containers. What we want is to get into building materials in the facilities. And the so with new building products that are being used, the way you would fight a fire is mm. completely different. That's that's the level of data we need to yeah. get. But, and we may end up <clears throat> taking the committee and going boots on the ground and each of us to do some of that, but we were hoping to avoid it, but we're probably not going to. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> okay. Good. Any more questions, comments, concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Schedule the reorganizational meeting. Uh, next month is uh, when the board will have a new board. Um, we wanted to ask the board if um, they had a preference for when it wanted to meet, whether it be the day after town meeting on the 4th of March or whether it be the week after during the, the normal meeting day of the select board. Um, Which would be the 12th? the 9th, I believe, of March. No, no, I'm sorry, you're right, 12th. the 12th. So I will be away until the 10th. If that has any bearing on the situation, I can still call in if you'd like. So sure I have no have preference either way. Pressing. I've no. not really ever understood why we meet to organize and then meet again. To We've been doing it for 100 years. I know. Tradition. Mm. I mean, I'm. I guess I'll, I'll call in if you guys want me to. It's fine. I have no problem with that. Or it doesn't yeah. take us that long. I mean, unless there's some pressing reason why we need to meet right away. I, mean, I, I don't, don't know why we would. See, I, I mean, there's just a little lag in time of who's really on the committee. But you know, we're talking a week here or less, right? So there's some appointments you have to make, but I mean, it's pretty unlikely anything's going to be an emergency between that period of time. Mm -hmm. 
If it is, we'll hand it off to Barry. Sure, hand it right off to me. <laughs> Call me right up. I'm happy to take care of it for you. And if, if, the, if there is an issue, there's still a majority of the board yeah. that is available um, and concurrently serving. So, you know, if we needed to have an emergency meeting, we could have the three All sitting members of the board hold a meeting. Well, the board is actually what's voted. Oh, exactly. Yeah. At that point, anyway. Yeah. So it's not to decide who's on the board. Yeah. It's to start appointing people on committees and all that. Right. It's so. committee appointments. Yeah. So. I think it's fine to wait until the 12th. All right, May. All right, so yep. we're going to go March 12th for the regular meeting. That was easy. That was great. Okay. Working Communities Grant. Uh, the Workies Communities Grant is uh, a grant that the town uh, participated as part of a group. We um, were successful in receiving the initial $15,000 grant from the Boston Federal Reserve. This $15,000 grant uh, with no match uh, will allow us to continue working with other towns in our, in our partnership to develop uh, um, the goals that we're hoping to, to develop, which is um, increased regional activity and if we are successful we are uh, one of eight uh, groups that were selected in Vermont if we're successful we can apply for a much bigger grant of three hundred thousand uh, dollars payable over a three-year period, three -year period. Yeah. Uh, we're really hoping to receive that grant we do feel that we have a great uh, group um, and with all the activity and growth and the grants that we've received over the last two years leveraging those successes uh, will potentially lead into this this new, much larger three hundred thousand dollar grant. Can every group get the three hundred thousand, or is there a limit? Uh, of the eight, there is a limit of five. I believe there's four. Four or five. Yeah. So we're we're whittling down the group. There's so four. Yeah, four. And then there was the piece that because we're an opportunity zone, that has a little something to do with this. Yeah. Because they're treating opportunity zones are supposed to be getting preferential treatment because of the demographics of opportunity zones. So in Josh Field, we have a very strong chance of securing this. So opportunity zones were highlighted actually yeah. in some of the plans at the federal level going forward even to try to give additional resources to them and whatnot. So we could see it playing out as points added in scores at the federal level for grant applications now. And uh, another good point, if we, as we move forward with the $15 grant that the board accepts, there was a group to the south of us that included Royalton, Stratford, um, and a few other smaller towns in their area. This the group that was successful that includes Randolph is considering expanding the group to include them, so it would bring all, almost all of the towns in the White River Valley area together, so it would make us a more attractive group because now we include Randolph, which is the anchor for the group that we're in, and then also Royalty, which was the anchor for that group, because they're also part of an opportunity zone. Um, it would make us a much more competitive group. Yeah, but they were not chosen. So yeah, that's we're not why chosen. we could add them to our group. Oh. Yeah. And yeah, they were part of an unsuccessful attempt at $15,000, but if we rolled them into ours, we're a much bigger area, much bigger group, two opportunity zone. Towns. It appears that similar, similar discussions were had for the type of Funding, but what do you do with funding? So they're comparable. So, yeah. Nice. So, good stuff. So, we need a motion to accept the grant. Motion to accept. I just did it. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stand. Motion carries. USDA grant gear house. This grant opportunity is one that Josh found online. Uh, it is meant to help uh, businesses in rural areas. Um, the understand or the thought behind applying for this grant is that it would help the potential tenant at the at the hub, the, the bicycle shop, um, to be able to provide them with some expertise and training opportunities to become more successful. Um, if the board allows us to apply for this grant, we would use the successes of the Boric grant, the private donations that have come to the hub, and uh, hopefully if we are to receive this grant, this money could be used to make that business successful and 
help to continue growing the outdoor economy. Uh, so he's looking for permission just for authorization to apply? To apply. Right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Authorization will apply. Yeah. Well, I would make a motion that we uh, ask Josh to apply for this grant for, um, on behalf of the uh, Gear House. Seeking ten thousand dollars would be the amount that they would see that. Okay. So you can get up to half a million, though. Mm. Why would you stop it? <laughs> <laughs> Ferraris for everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a beneficial thing. You know, these guys are young guys, and they're going to need some help. Mm -hmm. oh. We need to help that business get. We need to get them off the ground. Yeah, It'd be really great. Yeah. Paul and I have been giving some creative suggestions here lately, so it's obvious they could use some assistance. So. Maybe we should look at that grant application before it goes in, see if there's anything else we can roll into it. Roll into mm -hmm. it. Yeah, we we'll talked with Josh about that. I could share. We could share with, with the board before we pull it together. As we're pulling it together, we could just share it. Yeah. Or just even what the outline of it is. What sure. they're thinking and see if it sparks an idea that somebody might know something else that's going on that we could put in with it, especially when it's training and things like that they're providing. Is there somebody else out there that could benefit from the same training that might mm -hmm. help yeah. oh. add points? Sure. Yep. Okay. Um, before we leave grants, just a note for the board the East Randolph Valley Group got their first report in on the building, but they they wanted to be on the agenda to be considered to apply for the second phase of the grant, but they didn't. I didn't get a write up from them of what the second phase was going to do and whatnot. So we we can expect we'll see that probably soon. Um, so the first phase of evaluating the town hall there is mm -hmm. completed. Mm -hmm. It's a very just extreme thumbnail sketch. The second phase of this is through the preservation trust. Yeah is bringing in actually somebody to evaluate the structure itself and so better i think they feel they're ready to go but they didn't i didn't get the summary of what the second yeah. grant was going to do so it wasn't ready to come to the board yet. okay but it will be they're moving along and gaining a little momentum yeah and they feel they need both of these reports to start doing fundraising and Folks to be committed to mm -hmm. raising the <coughs> Yep. All right. Draft tax stabilization policy under old business. Uh, we did not include uh, the existing draft in your packets and would like to ask if we could postpone it to the next meeting. Sure. Fire services wage discussion. Oh, yeah, uh, yes, that was a, a vote that had been taken by the Fire Service Advisory Committee, which uh, um, apparently there was, there may have been some, uh, a misunderstanding from when the meeting initially occurred between the members themselves, because I had a member of the committee uh, come to speak to me and say the minutes did not actually, actually reflect what they felt uh, had happened at the committee itself. Um, so I still need to reconnect with the committee itself to ask what actually was discussed during the meeting as opposed to the revision of, of the minutes. Because uh, what has since been reported to me, uh, and apparently maybe in the works of changing the minutes, is that the committee did not vote to raise their wages, but instead voted to advise the board to consider raising wages. Um, and the reason why that difference is, is um, important is because one is dictating to the board that raise, wages need to be increased, and the other is asking the board to potentially consider raising wages to, uh, to our firefighters. So. 
But my understanding of the challenge is that there is there's two totally different perspectives on <coughs> what that race equals. Yeah. The coming out of the committee, it was only around a thousand dollar cost to the town. Coming out of Cliff, it was more like a five or six thousand dollar cost yeah. for what they were requesting. And so I was expecting yeah. we would see that analysis of what is the true cost to the increase they were requesting. You're right. Uh, the, the, the information is as it's being relayed to, to the town is very station focused. And so one will hear an amount of, oh, it's only $800, $1,000. But that's only for a station. And then we start considering wages for all the departments in addition to uh, workers' comp payments, in addition to all these other payments that we have to make that are off the books. Mm -hmm. uh, or they're on the books, but they're not necessarily seen. They're just, you know, firefighters or everyone just sees their wage, their check. Right. But there are all these other payments that, that have to be made. Uh, and that's closer to the amount that Trini is referring to. It's not just the wages, but it's the wages plus workers' yeah. comp. It's all plus the insurance. pieces of workers' comp and all, yeah. All exactly. Exactly. So, so one of the things that we, as a bit of a tangent to this, one of the things that we in the finance department did was at the end of last um, payment cycle uh, or last calendar year, we included a memo in every staff member's pay stub that said this is this is your wage uh, as a cost of the town and this is what you don't see which is the insurance payments made on your behalf for vision health dental and everything else so everyone now knows what that their cost is to the taxpayer which is their salary plus the additional benefits that are paid on their behalf so what their total cost is to the taxpayer um, payment to firefighters is very different Two of our three stations get uh, paid once a year, so to them, you know, it's it's harder to communicate with them in this way. But uh, Petrini's right; um, it's not just the raise in wages; it's raise in wages uh, plus all the costs that go with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's how do you get your head around what they're asking? Is it unreasonable? Yeah. But you gotta have everybody with the same understanding of what it is they're asking. Before you can. One of the options that I do hope to bring is criticism we hear regularly from some fire leadership is that it's usually the same firefighters that show up to fire scenes and not so much the, uh, so the issue isn't so much you have a full staff of 25, it's you typically have a core that show up, which is 10 to 12. Right. So I haven't approached the majority of the, of the group with this option, but it's trying to change the mentality of, well, maybe it's reducing the total um, roster from 25 to, let's say, 15, and raising wages for those 15, and trying to make it more of an exclusive group as opposed to, we're begging people to be a member, more of a, we're an exclusive group, we show up to these scenes, we're fairly compensated, but breaking into this group is a very, hard thing to do, so you have to be with us, kind of like a trial membership. Um, it, it's kind of those little tweaks here and there. I haven't approached the fire department yet on being able to do that, if they're interested, but you know, it's, it's like having a nightclub. A nightclub on the inside could be empty, but you have a long line outside, and people think it's the hottest club in the world. <laughs> um, so it's just the perception of it. And in this case, if we make 15 highly paid firefighters the priority, everyone wants to be a part of that group, and then it becomes, you get highly... So, I don't think any of them do it for the pay, right. is yeah. what we hear. Yeah. No, I don't I think can so. tell you, but if you look at some of the surrounding departments and what they're paid, it's much less. Yeah. You know, I'd hate to have to live off Jeff's volunteer check. Right <laughs> yeah. Now, but, um, yeah, but then, like you said, they're not, but it's I not about it's, the money for them. It's just, yeah. what's, it's, what's fair compensation? Well, it's also about what do you have for a volunteer pool? Because mm -hmm. I might only be here nights because I work out of town. So I'm not going to be able to cover you during the day. Right. And this guy's got the expertise on this type of fire and the training and the background. And so it, it's when you, I'd hate to start limiting below the number they have now when they have a fire and three people show up because it's during the day yeah. and everybody has to work out of town. You know, hopefully as we continue to build jobs in town, then 
maybe that option's there because back in the day when we had Ethan oh, yeah. Allen and all them, oh, yeah. Ethan we had no Allen, problem the filling the fire yeah. roster yeah. and we had no problem with full compliments yeah. responding. So I just want to. Different world. I'm a little not nervous about narrowing the number of them. Yeah. Because it's, you know, if they were full time employees, we would definitely have yeah. a much, much higher mm -hmm. cost on our hands. And that's some of what we're, and you know, we agreed that the fire services committee agreed to take on the compensation question mm -hmm. in our whole list of, of <laughs> goals, um, but to look at, you know, what, how do you balance it? and stay on the right side of the law. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds like you have more homework to do here. I think so. Yeah. All right. Appointments. We have some recommendations for the Water Wastewater Committee, but we would be appointing them to reappoint again in a month. In a month. In a month. So it looks like the recommendation is to hold off and appoint in March. Uh, that, that would be my recommendation, but we um, wanted to give the board the option. If, if, Are they meeting? If, Anything going on there, Larry? Chris has been talking about scheduling a meeting for a while now. I don't know what his plans are for the immediate future, whether he would really like to do something sooner or later, but I know he's been, it's been on his plate to, to like, to get something going. Um, There's no harm in putting somebody on and then reappointing them in a month. Either. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. I mean, I'm fine by me if you way. If you're having a meeting and you need some, you need a staff person, somebody willing to volunteer, I'd say put them on. Yeah. Well, we got two volunteers for one vacancy. Well, we, so it's 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 set up as a five member committee. Is that right? Uh, yes. What I had listed was uh, a user member. We had John Lutz. We had Jay Hooper. We have Dave Farnham, and then the. Uh, uh, Vacancy left by Suzanne. Now, I, it could be bigger. I, I think there could be an error in that I saw what was listed on our website, and it may not have included two vacancy listings. Um, uh, but we can choose to enlarge it yeah. right, and recognize that. Right. I think, I think in the short term, like if we did need to meet, it would be nice for it to be bigger, just because right now there's really just three of us, because Jay, three, right? Jay, well, Jay, Jay is officially on the committee, but he def, he has not come to a meeting. It's difficult to get him there. Well, difficult is a kind of understatement. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and um, so I would I would propose that we appoint the two people that are um, that are requesting to be on the committee and, and and get Jay off because he hasn't shown any real indication that he you know, intends to. Sir. Okay. We could deal with that part next month. Yeah. In terms of other Jay wants to whether reappoint him or something. Unless we need his slot to appoint both of these. Right? Um, well, I mean, can we make can we make the committee bigger right now? Sure. Because we could do it's that the power too. Power of emotion. <laughs> we, could just, we, we could we could leave Jay on it and and give him another chance to yeah. to commit himself to the to the committee if he if he do, if he wants to. I can I can uh, be in touch with him and uh, and we can make it seven if it's not already seven. Uh, it's five. Yeah, if it's not already seven. Yeah. And then um, and appoint these these two folks who have expressed interest. Anybody know these folks? I think one of them is here. Too, right? mm -hmm. I, I know, I know one of them um, is a neighbor of mine. I think he would be good. He also actually has experience being on the water committee in a previous town in mm -hmm. Vermont. So I think he would, he would come with relevant experience also, which would be great. Mm -hmm. I don't know the other person who expressed interest, but she was here tonight. Was she? Oh, oh, right away. Right right oh. She works for Simons, I guess, which you should have experience. At least a knowledge, right? Because mm -hmm. she's in the office. That's what I mean, yeah, knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I'll move if we appoint those two people to the Water and Sewer Committee, Theo Johnson and Crystal Curry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other 
and well, increase the size to seven if that's what it takes. Correct, if needed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Uh, was Pat made the motion? Yep. And Larry, that was a second? Yes. Any other business? So, Dolph, will you be reaching out to those folks? I'll we'll reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have to reach out. Um, uh, well, we reach out to them, but we also have to reach out to the committee just to remind them that they need to check with their membership for those that want to be reappointed or not be reappointed. Do you have anything on your list for other business? Uh, I do. I'll, 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 I'll make it very quick. Um, one is we have uh, uh, an RFP out. We have two RFPs out at the moment. Uh, one is uh, for the two dump trucks for the town. Uh, we are expanding the radius of where we release it. So we posted the truck uh, announcement online. We sent it to local contacts. We're also sending it to um, retailers and manufacturers in Canada. Um, once we receive the bids in, we'll present them to the board and if the cost is low enough with the exchange rate of a truck purchase in Canada versus potential having to drop, drive it up there for maintenance, um, you know, we'll, we'll perform that analysis and share it with the board, but we're trying to get the cheapest possible uh, trucks um, that are available. Lowest price, most responsive. Exactly, yeah. And I said the cheapest, I was like, well, uh, <laughs> not necessarily. But, well. Um, it's good to have some competitive bids to see what's going on. Yeah. We um, are still working with the Department of Environmental Conservation with uh, our water uh, water issues. Um, becoming a little contentious, but uh, we'll, we'll keep working with them. Hopefully, we will not have to end up back in court. Um, but uh, we'll have more news to share with, with the board as we move forward. Um, the, I'm not sure if uh, Larry may be aware of this, but I believe the Water Wastewater Committee is potentially looking to make changes to, well, uh, the Water Wastewater Superintendent uh, may assume, make recommendations to the Water Committee uh, to include some penalties into our water ordinance. Uh, some of the issues that exist is um, uh, we have some of our larger companies that produce sprinkler tests uh, without informing the water district superintendent. That test tends to create issues with um, you know, uh, um, the quality of the water. Mainly what happens is somebody opens the tap, it's almost like a flush. It gets everything up, riled up, and uh, it could create water quality issues in residences. So um, there have been some repeat offenders. Our superintendent is concerned about the number of times they do it, then it costs the town for staff time and water that is released. So those are some changes that may come to the water committee at some point for their review. Uh, the R3 report uh, for the town's uh, process is now out. Uh, there's some copies upstairs, other copies have uh, been left throughout town. So, uh, so far it's been, it's been a good part of read. I haven't read the whole thing, but um, it's been a favorable report. Uh, and lastly, we, uh, some staff members, Josh um, uh, and I, and uh, several members of the board, uh, met with members of the board with RACDC recently to discuss a housing project in town. The town is interested in working with an organization called Twin Pines. Um, they have done some work with uh, Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation. They'd like to perform a project here in Randolph. Uh, we recently met with RACDC because they are our local housing organization to just to share the information to get feedback from them. Uh, we agreed that um, RACDC's board would, would discuss the issue. They've confirmed that with me that they're going to talk about it at their next meeting. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with the board that we're still having these conversations about potentially having a housing uh, project uh, at the Branchwood property. Uh, nothing is firm at the moment. It's still just ongoing conversations. Uh, I just wanted to share that with everyone. And that uh, that is really it, with the exception of uh, one lighter piece of news. Dave Crosby and I are undefeated at trivia uh, <laughs> for Echo Whiskey. We went to trivia last weekend and 
Uh, we didn't lose and we didn't win because it was canceled, but uh, it still says we're undefeated. <laughs> undefeated in undefeated. zero in a no contest uh, event. Exactly. <laughs> he knew all the answers. He knew all the answers. It was great. Yeah, yeah I couldn't match him up with the questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is all I have. Uh, <laughs> is that a combination of other? Business manager's report? Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? You know, if we turn it into uh, a paid to get into the bar event, we can generate some revenue for the town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody get the feeling that your school taxes are going to go down in the future? Uh, <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. I might tend to agree with some of the thoughts about increasing enrollment and more families coming here. I think that could be building, I think, based on what I'm seeing and feeling and hearing and knowing what's going on, you know, kind of in the background, some projects that are coming forward. So maybe, but, you know, I still don't see this much happening here until the grand list, list you know, increases. So, I mean, at least on both sides of that. So, anyway. Unrelated to the, the, the school budget, I, Cliff and I are projecting additional increases in revenue because of uh, pilot money that will increase. Mm -hmm. um, so if all things stay steady for the town, we may actually see a very favorable tax rate for next fiscal, not the next one, but the one after that because of the pilot money that will come. Not just Well, not just the pilot money through the state for the state lab, but also... Right. Uh, um, uh, potential increases to Freedom Foods and some of these other projects that are eventually going to start to come online, LED's project. Um, so we're, we're seeing some favorable projections over the next few years, at least from our side. Um, but the school district is, is Yeah, and that's why, you know, the Salisbury Square project, if it moves forward and becomes a, you know, an asset that's taxable, along with, you know, need them both. Yeah, you need them both. I really think yeah, you need them both. Absolutely. I think they're both, I think you need both of them because they, they're they hitting different income levels, yeah. right? That's what I get out of this. Both, both meaning South Well, the project that, you know, branch 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 project could be, you know, could be yeah. another potential, to, that's, those are higher income type units. So, you know, I think they both could raise the, raise the bar here. Yeah, a little absolutely. Bit. Those coupled with, you know, again, LED, with the extension of Freedom Foods and all these other projects coming on. Uh, we're actually growing the, the tax base. Yeah. So, and, and something good. Yeah, it could be entering a nice sort of virtuous cycle here where success breeds more success. We'll be building two there's new a, houses in the East Valley. There's a sign off of those. I just saw it. Did you see the paper in Apple's office? <laughs> So, did you see the the, the, the valley the, the White River Valley Herald in the Duffel's office, the 1960s version? Oh, 61. Did you see that? No. You should show it to him. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of ironic. Yeah. I get a copy of that the next day. Give yeah, it, 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 after the day after Trini shared this yeah. paper with me, Perry found a, another copy you elsewhere. Another copy but of it. It's if we're reading the report, it was from 1961. It says that the town has entered a period of growth. It showed all these great projects coming online. And the things that were happening from 50s to the 60s. Yeah. The interesting thing is that it, it, for the most part, you can change that whole report to now and then just change the pictures from all those projects from back then to the projects that are happening now. Um, so town on the move. Town on the move. Yeah, that's so. what it was called. Yeah. yeah. You should go look. It's, yeah, it's, pretty it's pretty It's pretty, it's a, it's a, yeah. Uh, so six pages. Before they uh, actually, it's, yeah. It's six or eight pages of, of you know different businesses that were growing, you know, expansions. Brand it new. Was, yeah, brand new things that were here. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, right, White River Valley Herald, I think it was. Yeah. 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 Huh? That's funny that you got it. I was like, I was <laughs> over <laughs> Sam Hooper's, and I'm like, you told me about it, and then I'm like, ten, like, like two hours later, I'm over there, and I'm looking at this thing, and it's buried in a pile of paper, and I'm like, what's that? And I pull it out, and it's the same thing you told me about. It's like, wow. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. That was, I don't know where he got it from. It came, well, there's left in the glove factory, and there's a pile of stuff. But the glove factory's mentioned in it. That may have been why it was there. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, so. Clint's actually had it. He collects a bunch of them. Yeah. A bunch of the type of memorabilia from town. And yeah. So. They had it in it's their archive. Stuff. Okay. Well, do we well, need to do a one. story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's already written. It's just, you know, rewriting it. Yeah. Just got to change. Somebody's been around planting 
old newspaper. That's what I'm wondering, right? Uh, <laughs> Somebody over there, that, is the Herald missing some out of their archives or something? Who knows? I'll have to look. Yeah. you have to look. All right. Motion to adjourn. I second it and move that we go down to the high school to watch with Matt and the rest of the place last year all again. Well, I'm going to go make snow. Oh. That's what I'm going to go do. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.